to a book you might skip over if you go too fast from Judges to Samuel. It's the book of Ruth. So go to the book of Ruth. It's right between, it's easy to remember because it goes Joshua, Judges, Ruth, like Joshua's really mean. So Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the book of Ruth. Okay, once you're there, in your eyes so I know you're there. Glad you're there. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The book of Judges. Right after you. Pray, we pray for us and we'll, we'll dive right in. Lord, your word's good and you're our merciful Savior, our Redeemer, our friend, and you care for us and you provide for us and you are working on all things for your goodness and for us to praise your name. Lord, help us to see that and see it in the story of Ruth. I asked you that what's your favorite story for the question, and I want to ask you another question to get us started, is what elements, like what really makes the, a story really, really good? I talked about a good hero, a good problem to solve. What else makes a really good story? Ella? A good villain. A good villain? What else? What makes a, what makes a good story that we love to hear or watch again? A good hero? Do you guys like someone who's super strong and can defeat everyone or someone who's an underdog? Which one do we like more usually? Underdogs. Underdogs. We like cool runnings because they're underdogs and they come up to win, right? Micah. Plot twists. When something's going one way and all of a sudden shh, takes a left or a right turn or complete reversal, that we like those make things interesting. There's another problem in it. One more thing. Anything else? Ben? An element of someone behind the scenes where the story's going as it always is, and all of a sudden, phew, here comes a new revelation from someone that's always been there. Luke, I am your blank. Because that's who hasn't seen the original Star Wars? Everyone's seen the original Star Wars, so they know like the twist. Who's never seen I don't want to spoil it. Everyone's seen it. Okay, we're good. Luke, I am your father. That's a play. That's a big <laughs> That's a big reveal from like all the other stuff in the story, right? So why do we love good stories? We love good stories because they're entertaining and they get us out of our world and help us see something that's fun and engaging. But also, it ties us in and reflects on the greatest story that God's working through history and in time and even now from way back then and going towards the very end, God is working out his story. And just as people are in distress, here comes a hero to solve our problem and to save people from what's happening. The story continues to the end where there's a celebration and a victory, right? We all love those kinds of stories. And the story of Ruth, though it's only four short chapters you can read in a couple minutes, it's a jam-packed of a great, good story. We love reading stories like this because there's, there's no villain, but there's stress, there's hard times, and there's a happy ending in the end. Spoiler alert. So as we're going through the book of Ruth, let me get us reoriented, right? Where are we from last week? Where is Israel? Where's the place? The nation of Canaan, which is now Israel's land. That's where they are. And who's been the person leading them into that charge to take that conquest of the land? Samuel? Joshua. Joshua, strong and courageous, leads God's people into the land. They take it by being obedient. And from that, Joshua comes from after 40 years in the desert, where God's people are disobedient and unfaithful, even though they've been rescued from slavery in Egypt. So now, from slavery, from the wilderness, to their land, now in a period of the judges. And what is the cycle of the book of Judges? Is it a good upward trend? Or is it a downward negative slope? Which one? Negative. negative slope. It goes continually downward. It gets worse and worse and worse until you get to a depraved scene of things you can't describe in youth group. It's that bad. And so now, in the book of Ruth, in verse 1, chapter 1, it says, In the days when the judges 
rules, right? This is when we are in the, the black backdrop of the book of Judges. This is where Ruth is. And you can summarize the whole book of Ruth, the theme through it, is a journey from emptiness to fullness. It's a journey from barrenness to abundance. It's a journey from deprivation to restoration. It's a story of emptiness to fullness. Okay, so the book of Ruth is all about what? Emptiness to fullness. fullness. Great, now you know what the book of Ruth is about. It's a journey of faith and seeing how God plays these things out for good and blessings, not just for Ruth and her family, but for all of us, for all of us. Because the problem is that starts out in the book of Ruth is that someone's choices lead to their consequences, and now they're enduring the things which now God rescues them from in the book of Ruth. And just how someone in this story seeks to find life outside of the Lord, seeks to find fullness somewhere else besides what the Lord provides, it always leads to ruin and a life of bitterness. So where God leads to fullness, you guys doing good? You good? Titus? Thumbs up? Fantastic. So it's where as following after what we want leads to misery and bitterness. Following what God says is good leads to life, at least to fullness. So let's look at Ruth. And then we have three points today that I have with some different letters. So point number one is three C's. All right? So point number one is three C's. And those C's are consequences, conversion, and commitment. Consequences conversion, and commitment. If this was a movie, if this was a story, a movie adaptation of the book of Ruth, the opening scene would be a family in a desert land with the beating sun down on their heads, moving out of their hometown. That would be the opening scene of a husband, Elimelech, taking his wife, Naomi, and their two sons away from Bethlehem into the land of Canaan, into the land of Moab. And so it's, while the judges are happening, God's curses are starting to come because people are being unfaithful. So God comes with consequences, which is famine and barrenness. But what would God do if the people repent and turn to him? He would send a judge to rescue them, but then the cycle would repeat. So now we open the story, now people are having the consequences of their sins, and Elimelech, this guy, stands at this crossroads with his family, saying, is he going to pick trusting the Lord, or is he going to pick somewhere else for provision? Is he going to trust that God will provide, or is he going to pick what he can provide for him and his family? Well, he doesn't trust the Lord, and so he goes to Moab. And if you guys know anything about Moab, Moab is a place where they don't like Israel, they tempted Israel to be unfaithful to the Lord and sent in people to commingle with them, to lead them to idolatry and unfaithfulness. And then, oh yeah, there's a king from Moab who took over Israel, and God had to send a guy named Ehud with the dagger and the fat thing, you know, he's no that judge, right? To kill him. So Moab's not the best place to take your family to raise kids. Not the best place to go. And when they get there, Elimelech and Naomi let their sons marry people from Moab, named Moabites, which is a big no-no for God's covenant people, right? God's people are supposed to be his, be holy, to be separate, so to take people not in the covenant and to bring them in mingles it and cuts people off from that blessing. It's a no-no. It's a big no-no. And what happens is that in 10 years, Elimelech's dead, the sons are married to their wives with no children, and now they die. So now Naomi, seeking to go to a place to find provision, now has no husband, no sons, and daughters-in-law who are not Israelites, who don't know the Lord. And in verse 6, then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that's Naomi, to return to the country from Moab, for she had heard of the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Right? So God's people have repented. He's graced them with food. And now she hears, oh, now there's provision, which she should have thought about in the first place 
before she left. But now she's going back to the place to find food. And she's telling her daughters to go back to Moab, right? Like, daughters, just leave me. What am I going to do with you? I can't, I can't provide for you. I don't have any sons for you. Go back to your people, to the place that's familiar, and leave me, and I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. Now, if you're, if you're a Christian, which I hope we all are here, would you tell someone, like, hey, go back to Buddhism, like, go back to whatever spiritualism you want, like, go back there because there's nothing for you in Christianity. Would you guys say that? No, that's anti-evangelism. And Naomi's saying, no, go back to your gods, go back to your people, don't follow me into God's promised land. Like, go away. Why would she say that? Because a life for a widow woman who's a foreigner to go somewhere outside of her land is extremely hard, dangerous, and seemingly hopeless and lonely. So it's a very hard choice. Because it's much easier to be a citizen in your own land, have a family to help take care of you, and a place where at least you have more rights than other places in your own country. Does that make sense? And so one daughter, Opa, Oprah, Oprah? No. Orpa. Orpa seems to choose the, the better way. And she leaves, she listens to Naomi's plea and goes back to her people and back to the way that looks better. But for Ruth, Ruth doesn't take no for an answer. She clings to Naomi, she hears her words. And look at verse 16. Look at verse 15. And Naomi says, See, your sister in law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth's words should surprise you. So she says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Where you will go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi heard, saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. So why does... Orpah seemingly choose like the better route, and Ruth chooses the harder, more sacrificial, the more lonely, the more uh, seemingly hopeless route for her. Why does she choose that instead? It's because Ruth, Ruth has discovered that the Lord is God of heaven and earth, God over all creation, and the Lord Ruth figured out that to have God and nothing material or land to call her own or comforts that are nice is better than to have everything that she needs physically but be without God. She figured that out. She figured out that God is better even with nothing. I'm going to trust him with everything I have. And that is better than to have everything I need for living and comfort and not have. She figured that out. And she figures that out from a family of unfaithful Israelites living in Moab. I think that's hilarious. Like, Ruth is the faithful, committed one in a family of people who are uncommitted and unfaithful to the Lord. Like, God works in all sorts of people's lives and doesn't need the best people to make sure that he's, he's the best. So her conversion to the Lord as her God leads her to commit to Naomi. And what she's doing is she's showing kindness. And it's a special word called Haset. It's H-E-S-E-D. Haset. And that is an exceptional kind of love that goes above and beyond what's required of people. And Ruth is saying, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to commit my whole life to you. And I'm going to help you, Naomi, even to the sake of my own she is loving beyond the point of her job description, right? So in this first section, I want you to see that there's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to conversion. Because Ruth's life just now got much, much harder, even though it was hard before. And there's seemingly hopelessness going wherever she's going into the land of Israel. Because no one's going to take care of her. No one knows her. She has no rights, and she has no husband. To protect her. Things don't look great in that culture in that time. So have you counted that cost if you're not a Christian or if you are a Christian in here? Have you counted that cost that God says is costly to follow him? 
Have you counted the cost that following Christ is also taking up your cross daily and going after him and dying to yourself and living for Christ? That is hard, and that's costly love. To love the Lord that way, and then to love other people that way. That's the, that's the call for all Christians, and it is costly. And Ruth saw that it was better than everything else over here. She counted the cost and found that this is much better to have God and nothing else materially. So that's point number one. We got two widows who are on the road to Bethlehem, and things don't look that great. So in part number two, we have three P's. Three P's. And I'll go through these a lot faster. We have providence, protection, and provision. All right, Providence, protection, and provision. So they come into Bethlehem, and people start to notice, like, hey, is this Naomi? Hey, we know Naomi. We used to go to school back in the day. What are you doing here? Where's your husband? How have you been? What's going on? And she says, no, no, don't call me Naomi. I'm not Naomi, which means pleasant. I'm not pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Lord's dealt bitterly with me. The Lord has come against me. The Lord's given me nothing. Uh, but who's with her? Ruth. So is Ruth nothing to her? Like, is having someone be with her nothing? Like, does she not see that? I think her grief is really blinding her to what's good in Ruth that she has. But Naomi, in her distress, is bitter. Now she says, call me Mara, and they come into Bethlehem, which means the place of bread, which means the full place of bread, and they're coming right at the time of the harvest, when things are starting to be picked. And now we meet a new character. We have Naomi, Ruth, and in chapter 2, verse 1, Naomi had a relative, her husband's a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Here comes the third character, Boaz. He seems like a good guy, a worthy man. And now... If you're a widow in this culture in this time, and you have no husband to provide for you, and you have no children, and you're a foreigner without any kind of community support, how do you provide for yourself? Well, God made a way to do that called gleaning. Gleaning, that when harvesters came, they cut down all the, all the crops, and whatever is left over from the gleaning, the poor and the, the people, like the widows, could take those things to their house and use them for food. It was a lot of hard work with very little reward. But Ruth did that from sunup to sundown. She was a really hard worker. And she put her faith into action. She said, like, all right, I'm going to go try to find a field where some guy's going to have favor with me, have grace up on me. And it just so happened, in verse 3, she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come upon the part of the field belonging to none other than Boaz, right? It just so happened. She just kind of stumbled across it, not planning it. And she meets the character Boaz. Now, the funny thing, do you know who's kind of absent from this story? God, actually, is not actually doing anything, saying anything, or directly speaking or working things like he usually has been the last couple of books we've read. But everywhere behind the scenes, just like Ben said, like, Things are happening, all of a sudden you see a curtain pulled back that someone's been working in the background all the way to this time. That's the Lord of the story. He's just so happening to direct Ruth to this field, to this guy named Boaz, who happens to be related to their former father-in-law. And he finds out, hey, who's this woman? What? Who is this she? She's a foreigner. What is she doing here? And the workers say, oh, she's been here for all day, on all night. She's been working really hard. And she's a gleaner, and she's taking care of Naomi. And Boaz tells her, hey, Ruth, I've heard of your faithfulness to Naomi. She's my relative. Hey, you don't go anywhere else. You stay here and glean in my field. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. And I'll give you more than you pick. So don't go anywhere else. Just stay here, and I'll take care of you. And Ruth's like, why have you looked upon me? Why do you... Why do I find favor in your eyes? Like, what have I done that you, you care for me like you refuge me under your wings? And uh, I just wonder if Boaz's family paid a big part in that. Because you, do you guys know, if you read in the genealogy of Matthew, do you know who Boaz's mom was? It was Rahab, 
You guys remember who, who she is? She's that foreigner from the land of Jericho who heard of all that God's been doing and says, your God's the true God of heaven and earth. I'm going to forsake all of this stuff and I'm going to go with you guys because you guys, like the Lord's with you and I'm going to be with him. So I wonder if Boaz like saw just like, oh, he's just, she's just like my mom. She's a foreigner seeking the true God with a heart of faith and I'm going to help her. I wonder if his family put that character into him. And so he cares for her. She goes back with a lot of wheat and Naomi's like, wow, what did you do today? How'd you get so much stuff? And she's like, oh, this guy named Boaz gave me all this stuff. And she's like, Boaz? Boaz, he's one of our kinsmen redeemers. He's one who can help us. Because back in that time, there was a law where if you're a redeemer, you could take other people's in your family's property from, so if Elimelech died, all his stuff's over here, a redeemer in the family could purchase all of their stuff and leave it still within the family so Naomi and whoever else could be taken care of and so they have to sell their stuff. Does that make sense? Someone who takes on the burdens from someone else who's in trouble, okay? That's a redeemer. And so maybe he can help us. Maybe Boaz can help. So Naomi and Ruth conduct this plan. They're like, okay, okay, Ruth, you make yourself look really pretty. You go down and you propose to Boaz, and you ask, you say, can you be our kinsman redeemer? And so they, she gets all dressed up, and she goes down, and she tells Boaz, like, will you, like, will you marry me in a sense? Like, will you, will you cover me with your your garment? And like, would you, would you take us into your care and be our redeemer? And Boaz says, yes, of course I will. I love you, Ruth. I love your faith. I see your heart, and we'll make that happen. But, plot twist. There's some other redeemer who is closer in relative to Ruth and Naomi who is the first in line to get this property. And so Boaz says, we've got to talk to him first to make sure he doesn't want to do that first. And so Boaz is a seems like a very wise guy. So he goes to the other redeemer, Mr. So-and-so, and he says, hey, would you like to buy this field? It's a great deal. You can buy it, add it to your property, and all you have to do is take care of Naomi and her family. He's like, oh yeah, of course I will. I, that's a good deal. I only write the check right now. And Boaz says, oh yeah, but by the way, as soon as you buy that property, you also got to marry Ruth, the Moabite, because she comes with it. And he's like, oh no, never mind. I won't, I won't take that deal. You take that deal. And Boaz is like, I'll happily take that deal. And there's celebration and ceremony and rejoicing. They get married, have babies, and it seems like they live happily ever after as much as people can in the story of the Bible and in life. They live happily ever after. Naomi goes from bitter to pleasant and rejoicing. She goes from this woman who's lost everything and now seems to gain back so much more. Joy, life, family, blessing from the Lord. And God has been working out all those things in the background to make that happen. And at the very end of Ruth, this is kind of where things tie together from Judges and Ruth. Because in the book of Judges, there's all these people that do what's right in their own eyes because there is no what in Israel. No, no what? No. No, there's no king. There's no man to rule rightly. And who's the who's the grandfather? Sorry, let's just look at verse four, verse seven, chapter four, verse seventeen. And the woman in the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, "A son has been born to Naomi." They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You guys heard of David before? King David wrote all the Psalms. That guy sounds familiar, doesn't it? So God, in this microcosm of Ruth. He's taken a no-name Moabite woman. He's worked in her heart to trust the Lord from an unfaithful, gloomy situation. Brings her to just so happen to meet this great guy who understands that there's people outside of Israel who can love the Lord. And then has kids that produces this son, David, who's going to be a man after God's own heart and shepherd his people. And it doesn't just stop there, because in Ruth, it brings about the plan for David. But then all the way when it gets to the Gospel of Matthew, it says that there is the 
Boaz, who got Obed by Ruth, who got Jesse, who got David, all the way down to Mary and Joseph, who had Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. So in this, in this small four-chapter book, in this story, God's working out for people in that time and planning for things on to eternity. So the question is, what is God doing in your life that's connecting to that bigger story? Like, I can think of my life, like, there's a guy who's born in Portland, Oregon. His parents are going to get divorced. They're going to move to a no-name town in Montana. He's going to get a football scholarship at Tech. He's going to meet Christians there who are going to tell him to go to Seattle, who are going to go back to Billings, Montana, who then finally comes to Cornerstone, and now is here preaching to you today about God's grace. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, it doesn't make any logical sense. But God's worked those things together in my life, and he's working things together in your life. If you trace back like the things that just so happened, like, do you see God's hand working things out for good? Maybe you don't yet. Maybe you can look back before and say, yeah, God's been doing these things. I praise him for what he's continuing to do, because the work he started, he will complete in us, and he will finish. Because God works all things, all things good and bad, for good and for his glory. But in this story, Naomi couldn't see it yet at the very beginning. She starts to see it in the middle. She starts to bless God at the very end, because she's seen him work throughout that whole time. And they don't see the full picture yet. But one day, Ruth's name is going to be inscribed in Matthew 1, saying that you're a great, 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 so on, grandmother of the Savior of the whole world, the King of Kings. And that's pretty amazing. And it's hard, as I finish up, it's hard not to see Boaz as this man who has everything, who has all these riches, who has all this abundance, who has all this wealth, as someone who then cares for a woman who has nothing, who doesn't belong there, who can't afford anything, who's poor, and he comes and says, I'm gonna care for you. I'm gonna take you under my wing. I'm gonna shelter you. I'm gonna redeem you. Is that not a picture of Jesus who has everything? Everything. And then comes to us who has literally nothing. We're made of dirt. And says, I'm gonna give you everything. I'm gonna lay down my life for you so that you can be blessed and have everything everything in me. It's a wonderful story that points to the greatest story. Jesus, our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for, for good stories that all reflect your story. Lord, help us to see your hands in providence, working through all these little details and trials and troubles and good things in our life that work out for your good, work out for our good and for your glory. And Lord, help us to, to see them, help us to Rejoice in them and help us to trust you that you provide, that you protect, that you give abundantly. Praise in Christ's name.